Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this section, we'll resume our discussion of LV outflow obstruction, focusing on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We'll be using this roadmap to guide you through the presentation. We'll start off with a robust discussion of the obstructive physiology that is the hallmark characteristic of this disorder. It is useful to begin by considering the obstruction as a dynamic outflow gradient. The gradient refers to the pressure differences between the LV and those measured in the aorta. You can see in this image the relative changes in pressures that are generated by the stenotic lesion that is the physiologic hallmark of this disorder. I refer to this as a dynamic gradient to underscore it is not static. The intensity of the obstructive physiology will vary by a number of factors, but especially those that impact the left ventricular and diastolic volume, as you shall see. After our initial review of the obstructive physiology, we'll launch into a discussion of the cardiac pathology described by myocyte disarray, which is the second characteristic feature of this disorder. So with that introduction, let's get started. We'll be using this graphic throughout the presentation, so let's be sure we understand what we are looking at and the consequence of those findings. The first thing we observe is the asymmetry of the septum. It is disproportionately enlarged compared with the LV free wall. It is hypertrophic, and this is the sentinel finding that contributes to the outflow obstruction. Notice I said contributes, so there must be other factors, and you are correct. The arrow is pointing to the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. In patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, anterior motion of the mitral cusp during systole contributes to the outflow gradient. The valve leaflet essentially gets caught or dragged into the outflow channel, worsening the obstructive physiology. So it is the combination of septal hypertrophy with systolic anterior motion of the mitral cusp that creates the outflow obstruction. And what is the clinical manifestation of the outflow obstruction? Answer. Syncope. So if they ask the underlying cause of syncope in a young patient with a systolic murmur at the left sternal border, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy needs to be on your short list. Before moving on from this discussion of the obstructive physiology, you should be somewhat familiar with the other descriptive terms that they may use. The first, back in the day, is idiopathic, hypertrophic, subaortic stenosis with the emphasis on subaortic stenosis. It is an archaic term, but the description of subaortic tells us the site of obstruction and then they use the phrase stenosis. With aortic stenosis, we totally get the idea the valve is obstructed. Heck, with renal artery stenosis, we know the vessel is obstructed. And so it goes with IHSS. The subaortic region is obstructed as a result of septal hypertrophy. The other phrase that we already used to describe the macroscopic appearance is asymmetric septal hypertrophy. As you do questions, you may find these phrases used interchangeably. Continuing, we'll move on to the key pathologic description characterized by myocyte or myofiber disarray. Pictured on the lower left is the orderly arrangement of cardiac myofibers arranged in a neat parallel pattern. Compare that with the chaotic appearance that characterizes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This disorganized arrangement of myofibers doesn't just account for the hypertrophic phenotype, it has a much more sinister association, that being cardiac dysrhythmia. Patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are at risk of sudden cardiac death due to fatal arrhythmias. Got that? Here's a key derivative. Myocyte disarray in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy place them at risk for sudden cardiac death and or syncope. And here's the key take home from the first section of our discussion either outflow obstruction or arrhythmia can account for syncope. However, sudden cardiac death as a clinical endpoint results from the dysrhythmia associated with myocyte disarray. All right, let's move on to the definition and nomenclature associated with this disorder. We'll also circle back to another component of the pathology. So let's clarify what hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is and what it is not. Here it goes. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy refers to a specific class of genetic or familial disorders characterized by sarcomere dysfunction. This is in contradistinction to those that result in LVH as an adaptive response to increased afterload. The prototypic afterload disorders, aortic stenosis, as reviewed in the previous video, or hypertension. Unlike the myocyte disarray seen in the genetic causes of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the patient with concentric hypertrophy has thickened myocytes, which are well organized. And just to be clear as mud, there is no single genetic abnormality that defines hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This slide shows a non-comprehensive overview of genotypes associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Note, however, that the beta-myosin heavy chain defect, 
is well represented, accounting for 35% of the cases. And as an FYI, the majority of cases are missense mutations with single amino acid substitutes. This is not important for your purposes, but I mention it to set you up for the next slide. And again, this is only informational, but there are non-sarcomere metabolic cardiomyopathies, including the lysosomal storage disorder of Fabrase, and more important for this discussion, Friedrich's ataxia characterized by the Frataxin mutation. Frataxin is a mitochondrial protein, so this informs us that dysfunction of the mitochondria can lead to myocyte disarray and the hypertrophic phenotype. The only potential relevance of this discussion is that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the leading cause of death in patients with Friedrich's ataxia. It is a neat way for the NBME to join cardiac and neuropathology. Low yield stuff, but while we're in the neighborhood, thought I would mention it. And before leaving this discussion, if you can remember one of the missense mutations, make sure it's a mutated beta myosin heavy chain. And here is the summary slide of the genetic disorder of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus the adaptive pathology of concentric hypertrophy. All right, even though this may seem torturous, watch how we're going to bring this whole discussion together. Let's move on to the physical exam and the physical exam maneuvers. As you will see, the exam is simply a way to apply the physiology associated with this pathologic state. All right, here we have the systolic murmur of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy located at the left sternal border. We can see it radiating up toward the base. The intensity of the murmur will be related to the outflow gradient discussed earlier. Insofar as the differential diagnosis of murmurs at the left sternal border, we have VSD, which has a different exam and demographic characteristics, and these will be discussed in subsequent videos. Aortic regurgitation does radiate to the left sternal border, but this is a diastolic murmur, so there should be no confusion with that diagnosis. So that leaves us with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at the left sternal border. Any question will include additional clarifying features such as syncope in the young athlete and those maneuvers that impact the outflow gradient. Before addressing the maneuvers, Let's again eyeball this graphic. The exam maneuvers can do two things. They can quiet the intensity of the murmur through separation of the ventricular walls, or they can accentuate the murmur by bringing the walls into closer apposition. Your job will be to appreciate how this is accomplished on the physical exam. Recall, we discussed the physical exam maneuvers in our mitral valve prolapse video, but that discussion focused on the corda tendine anchoring the valve leaflets. In the case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the same maneuvers are employed with the same effect on left ventricular volume, but in this instance, our focus is on the apposition of the hypertrophic septum to the ventricular free wall. So when the patient performs the valsal maneuver, or simply stands, the left ventricular end diastolic volume is decreased. A decreased chamber size brings the walls into closer proximity, increasing the intensity of the murmur, which is to say, these maneuvers worsen the outflow gradient. Depicted here is the opposite effect. The two maneuvers of isometric hand grip and squatting effectively increase left ventricular and diastolic volume and create more distance between the free wall of the left ventricle and the hypertrophic septum. By reducing the outflow obstruction, the volume or intensity of the murmur is diminished. And so here are the four maneuvers the NBME likes to describe. Each of these affect end diastolic volume and thereby the degree of outflow obstruction, which can be expressed hemodynamically as a dynamic gradient between the left ventricle and the aortic pressures. This will be further clarified in our sample questions momentarily. So now let's bring all of this together with a series of four vignettes demonstrating how the NBME will attempt to assess your understanding of this condition. So here is a lovely question that assesses your understanding of the hemodynamics of this disorder. A patient has a systolic murmur heard at the left sternal border. Their baseline cardiac pressures are shown. Please take note of these normal pressures. Let's continue. And now for reference, a normal patient is taken to the cath lab. They are given an inotropic agent and their pressures are recorded following the infusion. As you can see, the baseline pressures rise both in the LV and in the aorta. This is an expected response to an inotropic infusion. So now returning to our patient with a systolic murmur, she is taken to the cath lab and perfused with an inotropic agent. Compared to the normal response just reviewed, we see a different set of pressures. You are asked to choose her diagnosis. I've included the normal response again for your reference. You can see that the LV pressure has risen as expected, but in our patient, the aortic pressure has fallen or decreased. What's up with that? So the answer to our hemodynamic assessment of the outflow gradient is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is an example of using the pressure gradient to assess your understanding of the obstructive physiology. The inotrope worsened the obstruction by bringing the LV walls into greater apposition. A similar response is observed during exercise. Let's again introduce the older term IHSS. 
the patient has subaortic stenosis, with stenosis being the operative phrase. In the face of an inotrope, they have a dynamic degree of obstruction reflected in the lower aortic pressures compared with the left ventricle. Insofar as aortic stenosis, where the rise in pressures might be dampened compared to normal, it would not cause a drop in systemic pressure. Let's try another question. As you can see, they're still coming after you for your understanding of this dynamic outflow gradient. In the first graphic, we see a mid-systolic murmur. In the second graphic, the Valsal maneuver is performed and the murmur increases in intensity. They are asking you to identify the condition that is most likely present. Well, to answer this question correctly, which most students do not, you need to understand two principles. One, venous return decreases with a Valsalva maneuver and two, which disorder or disorders are associated with an increased murmur intensity when the venous return is decreased. And here are your choices. Mitral regurge, aortic regurge, aortic stenosis, and tricuspid regurge, representing the majority of valvular heart disease, and they would all decrease in intensity with decreased venous return. They are all volume dependent. That leaves us with choice C, which is the correct answer, and choice D. Here you can see hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is referred to as asymmetric septal hypertrophy to underscore the different terms that might be used. Insofar as mitral valve prolapse, it too would worsen with decreased venous return, but the characteristic exam finding would be a mid-systolic click, not a holosystolic murmur. So the purpose of this question and the exam maneuvers in general are to assess your understanding of the dynamic outflow gradient. This is totally legitimate test fodder. And now Sachs has another one, this time applying pharmacological principles to the same concept. Which agent or combination of agents exacerbate our outflow obstruction? Well, now that you are experts, you should have no problem identifying the correct answer. You just need to select the answer that will decrease left ventricular and diastolic volume and thereby increase the dynamic outflow gradient. Good job! Nitrates and diuretics will decrease preload and end diastolic volume by differing mechanisms, but the result is the same, worsening of the obstructive physiology. And although we didn't emphasize the point, agents with negative chronotropic and inotropic properties do promote LV filling and thereby decrease the outflow gradient. And finally, just for fun, I've added this pop quiz where you need to match the graphic and tracing. I added this one just because I like you and wanted to once again remind you about the myocyte disarray and cardiac fibrosis that are associated with cardiac arrhythmias. On the right, you can see hypertrophied myocytes reflecting sarcomeres that are added in parallel as opposed to in series as we'll discuss in the aortic regurge video, which is right around the bend. And here was our roadmap. We beat to death the obstructive physiology and the pathologic finding of myocyte disarray. We highlighted the clinical presentation of syncope or fatal arrhythmias, especially in the young athlete. We emphasized the genetic nature of this disorder, highlighting the difference compared with other causes of LVH. We talked about the physical exam with maneuvers, which are used to punctuate the principles of the outflow gradient. And most importantly, we destroyed some vignettes showing how this material will be applied. There's a lot for you to chew on with this topic. In our next video, we'll move on to aortic regurgitation, concluding our discussion of the aortic valve and related pathology. I hope you had as much fun with this topic as I did. In time, you'll come to find the joy. If you have any questions about any of the material covered in this presentation, please contact me at 12 days. Thank you.